right, everyone. Hey, uh, welcome to our conversation on organized crime. We're delighted to be joined by uh, Mason PhD student, Henry Thompson. Uh, he's also a Mercatus Fellow. Um, our co-host today will be, again, Nicholas Wright, our webmaster at large. Uh, yeah, and we just want to uh, thank Henry again for coming on. Um, Henry, how are you doing? I'm just fine. Thank you for having me on. I'm excited to talk to you guys today. Yeah, really excited to talk to you as well. Um, Henry, so jumping right into it, your research combines two of the things I love the most, economics and The Sopranos. <laughs> so I just wanted to ask you how you got into this topic. What struck you uh, about organized crime and to apply econ to it? So it started with, uh, I was sitting in on a class with um, Peter Leeson, who's a professor here at Mason, my advisor and my chair. Uh, and I don't know, I can't remember precisely what he was talking about. He's talking about COS, vertical and vertical integration. Okay. And uh, how COS is a fantastic paper, one of the first kind of original papers on the theory of the firm. And in the paper, COS makes a very simple point that uh, when the price of using, when the cost of using the price mechanism rises, then people will substitute and vertically integrate or firms will vertically integrate, right? Mm -hmm. And vice versa. And so he said, he said, actually, now that I think about it, the prohibition is an excellent example of that, right? Because you have an exogenous increase in the price of using, in the cost of using the price mechanism to distribute and allocate resources. Um, we should expect more vertical integration within this kind of underground economy that produces and manufactures and distributes alcohol uh, relative to what otherwise would be the case. And I was like, oh my God, that's a great idea. So I, I, I emailed him, immediately after class and because I didn't get a chance to, to, uh, to catch him at before he left. And I said, Hey, that I think it's an awesome idea. Do you mind if I'd like take a stab at it and see, see, you know, whether it's worth something I said, sure, of course, like go ahead. Um, and so I said, okay, cool. So Peter Hazlitt, who's another student, uh, uh, I think he's a third year now. Um, he and I started working on a paper that kind of looked at the, how, it essentially tries to measure how vertically integrated criminal organizations, um, or at least those who were in charge of distributing and producing alcohol and also retailing alcohol were during the prohibition. And we ended up coming up with a, with a pretty good draft, but as it turns out, it's really hard to get data on vertical integration on illegal firms. So the paper is kind of on the back burner, but during the research, during, as I was reading and trying to learn as much as possible, both about the prohibition and organized crime during the period, I came across a number of references to uh, early mafia organizations and um, essentially early proto, not typical, but kind of um, like, and not so much typical organized crime in that, in how we know it in a la the Sopranos, but kind of the mafia before they came the mafia. And so that's kind of what got me really excited about organized crime specifically and thinking about um, how is it that people who are operating beyond the shadow of the state, they're essentially in an anarchic context where they can't rely on the state to enforce contracts. How do they organize, cooperate and exchange? And that's the, those are the th sort of things that I've been trying to think about for the past six to eight months now and trying to leverage all of or bring into play all of the economics that I've learned uh, during my time here at Mason. And so that's kind of a long winded roundabout answer, but yeah, that's no. kind of how I got into it. Awesome. That's fantastic. Um, you know, I'm actually uh, joining you all um, from Hoboken, New Jersey, um, I'm sitting in a coffee shop on, <laughs> on Hudson Street. So this is really, you know, this is a very um, bring it all together a, applicable topic. Uh, yeah. You know, with, with the scenery I'm, I'm amidst right now. Um, so I wanted to ask you, uh, what are the economics of, of the protection racket? So what's cool is, is economics is really good at Part of the, one of the reasons why I really like economics is it's really good at explaining. And so I've realized, because I, I had a pretty good background in political theory and political science. That was what I was planning to do essentially in undergrad. That's what my dad does. And so, you know, I, I had a lot of fun debating about, you know, the good and what is just and what is extortion and what is protection, okay? 
And I realized after a number of years here at Mason that a lot of that stuff is in fact um, naming rather than explaining. And economics is really good at kind of breaking, collapsing categories that are in fact somewhat arbitrary. And so when it comes to the economics of protection and extortion, analytically from the economic perspective, they are analytically the same thing. You have an, uh, and let me explain why it's the case that you could have something, how, how you could have them be the same thing. So um, there's a distinction between de jure property rights and de facto property rights, where de jure is essentially, you're the le- you have a legal claim to a particular asset. You have a, you have a legal claim to enjoy the, the value of a particular resource. De facto rights are essentially economic rights, that which you can actually enjoy. And as it turns out, there's a gap between de facto rights and de jure rights. And because, as it turns out, the state or the government can't protect your property perfectly, okay? Which means that you need to actually invest in protecting your property yourself. Otherwise, people wouldn't build fences, right? Just to give you a really simple example. It's costly to produce and protect your claim to the pool in your backyard. Otherwise, you're going to have rambunctious kids jumping in your pool at one o'clock in the morning and you don't want to do that, right? So to continue to enjoy the resource that is your pool and make your claim exclusive, make your enjoyment of the pool exclusive, you got to build a fence, okay? So that's only to say that there's some sort of impetus or there's some sort of value associated with protecting a piece of property and that your right to something like a pool is incomplete. In the case of extortion and protection in organized crime, uh, there are there's value out there that is ostensibly unprotected. If you don't own a gun, if you don't have metal fencing around your house or stuff like that, then uh, especially when you're producing, say, illicit services like drug trafficking or your your human trafficking or all the other sort of like loan sharking, horrible things that organized criminals tend to tend to tend to do or at least petty criminals tend to do um they might be able to self-supply their own protection right but as it turns out they can't protect themselves perfectly and so this is when the mafia and organized crime comes into play and they come into play and they say listen uh you might be pretty good at produce at protecting yourself but we're considerably stronger. In fact, we have an absolute advantage in violence. Okay. And if you don't pay us some sort of tribute, then we're going to break your leg, blow up your store or do something. Uh, We're going to inflict some sort of cost. We're going to kidnap your kids, like something not good. Right. And so you weigh the costs and the benefits of that particular offer. Now, keep in mind that extortion is not wholly lose win, right? So in addition to being protected from the extortionist, it's very often the case that mafia organizations also include protection from other extortionists. So if you're paying money to the mafia, what are you also protected against? Not only are you protected against other mafia extortionists, you're also protected from petty criminals. And so what actually, it's very often the case, particularly in the, there are lots of good examples in Sicily of, of grocers or store owners paying money to the mafia and then uh, uh, petty criminals essentially giving them a wide berth. And so if you, while many people tend, and the other thing too is just as an aside, extortion tends to have a very negative connotation with it, okay? Mm-hmm. And Diego Gambetta, one of the, one of the best, um, and one of the best, he's not an economist, but he takes a rational choice approach to the Sicilian mafia. He's fantastic. I cannot recommend uh, his work enough. He makes a very simple argument, which is it's like the people are on the margin in terms of, so consider demand for protection, right? You have the people at the top of the demand curve who have the highest willingness to pay for protection. Okay. They have the least number of substitutes. They have the most, um, uh, they're least able to protect themselves. They have them. They might own a supply chain that's most susceptible to interruption. And those guys are at the top of the demand curve. There are also people at the bottom of the demand curve, right? So these guys who like are 
it's like the rock the rock who also knows kung fu and has a gun and can protect himself just fine his demand for protection is not particularly high okay mm -hmm. and so the point is that extortion is essentially and there's some cost of producing extortion so you have an equilibrium price and quantity okay there are going to be people on the margin at the equilibrium who are going to be just willing to pay the, for the protection if they don't get the high quality protection that they that they allegedly want then they're going to shout to the rooftops these guys are taking all the money from me and i'm going to complain all about it i'm going to go to the state and tell on these guys and get these guys in trouble okay but it's what and so what the point is that we only ever hear the people on the margin complaining about mafias selling protection. We don't hear about all of the other people much higher along the demand curve who's who are actually being protected and actually benefit considerably from the protection. The, the other thing that, that organized crime often tends to produce is actually cartel services, right? Mm -hmm. So they increase the cost to entrance and they make cartel agreements binding when they otherwise everyone had would have an incentive. Um, each grocer, for example, would have an incentive to chisel, that is to cheat and uh, reduce their prices a little bit or like bundle in goods and services that might not, uh, th that they otherwise might not so as to make it more worthwhile and induce an increase in demand for their particular products relative to everyone else's. So that's all to say that um, the economic distinction between extortion and protection is far less clear and maybe even arguably identical than, than most people tend to appreciate, right? And it might even be the case that the people that are complaining about extortion are the, are the people who are like, again, on the margin, um, mm -hmm. rather than people, everyone else who's like benefiting from the, cartel, from the cartelization services, for example, right? So anyway. Yeah. Wow, that's really interesting. Well, it is. You can have like like an efficient allocation like that because you always think, oh, it's extortion. These people are just being brutalized. But no, there must be some willing participants who with the Precisely. protection is worthwhile for them. Yeah, that's really interesting. Precisely. And we need to account for all of the, I mean, listen, if uh, one of the key differences, I've been thinking about the distinction between the state and the mafia. Because again, this, like, this, relate, this issue of the extortion and protection, yeah. like, what does the state do? Its primary supply of services is what? Protection. Right? Protection, right? Yeah. Now, how no, do they? How do they? How do they pay for it? Sorry, go ahead, Nikki. No, I. Uh, you know, they 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 operate with a monopoly of violence too. Um, they do as well, and if yeah. so, but the point is that if you think about extortion and as protection, like, listen, they're actually producing the same good. They're actually mm -hmm. substitutes for each other, right? Yeah. Which is probably why the government really doesn't like mafias because they're competitors in the same market okay mm. and this uh, becomes clear by how many industries uh, you know organized crime was able to work themselves into um i i think that clearly illustrates what you're trying to say you know? yes i i i think that's very clear and the other thing too is like um in a world of positive transaction costs where it's difficult to define and enforce property property rights uh, in uh, stipulate a perfect contract that's impossible. You can only write so many contingencies and enforce so many contingencies. Um, you're gonna you're gonna have to either self supply protection, create a self enforcing exchange, or outsource the supply of protection. Now, as it turns out, there are people who in this market who are competing for your services, and that's either going to be the mafia, as is often the case, or it's going to be the state. Um, and I was thinking about why it's the case that people tend to prefer the state over the mafia, right? So a lot of people tend to be really interested in the mafia, but nobody's like, I'm going to go find the mafia. So they protect my stuff as opposed to the state. That's right. And I was trying to think about why that might be the case. It could be propaganda. So the state is really good at producing like advertising its services and uh, producing indoctrination, which increase, which shifts out the demand for their services. But there's also, I think, another factor at play, which is you have to ask yourself, what are the constraints that are facing the state in terms of the quality of the, the services that they supply? And what are the constraints that are facing the mafia uh, uh, when they supply protection? Okay. And in a, in a zero transaction cost world, they'd be identical. You wouldn't prefer one to the other. They would be perfect substitutes. But 
when you have a world of positive tra transaction costs, there tends to be one really strong constraint in at least democratic societies against protection providers, right? And those are just political constraints on actors, which is you can vote people out of office. Mm -hmm. How do you, can you, you can't vote mafia members out of office, yeah. right? Like you as a customer of their protect, like a victim is effectively of extortion services. You can't vote them out. Okay. But does that mean that you're unequivocally victim and you can never escape their extortion services? Mm -hmm. Not necessarily. What's the way in which you indicate to the mafia that they're producing a low quality service or less than what you otherwise would have contracted for. You go to another mafia. You go to, you go to another mafia. mafia. You move, you exit, you vote with your feet precisely, right? And so the point is, in general, it appears to be the case that governments, at least democratic governments, ha they have more constraints on opportunism. And I'm not saying that the mafia are unequivocally good. I think we just tend to underappreciate the services that they produce or the value that they produce. Um, but there are more constraints on government, which means that we capture a greater share of the surplus produced by protection, which means that on net, we tend to prefer the government as opposed to the mafia. And as an additional example of this concept, compare again, predatory states, right? What's the distinction then between a predatory state and a mafia group and a, like a, a democratic state? A predatory state essentially is a state in which there are no political constraints or there are no effective political constraints on political actors. And so you have dictatorship and totalitarianism, right? Consider a case like North Korea, right? What makes North Korea so difficult? Like they produce protection for the, for the civilians, right? Ostensibly. Um, but there aren't political constraints. And what else do the people not have? Uh, a way, a way to. Sorry, go ahead, James. No, 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 please, Nick, go ahead. No, 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 no. After you, after you. No, I, I was just gonna make a, a bad joke and say food. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, they don't. They <laughs> definitely don't have food, yeah. which is bad, right? But like, yeah. that's a funny point. Um, well, they have a, they have no way of changing, uh, you know, the the political framework with in, in which they're they're. Uh, so there are no inside. political constraints, but think again, we're thinking back to the mafia. One of the, one of the effective political constraint, one of the effective constraints against the mafia is that you can go to an alternative supplier, right? You can't leave North Korea. Yeah, exactly. You can't leave North Korea, nor can you constrain their operatives effectively politically. Okay. Which means that when people have fewer constraints, they're going to put it this way. When your wealth depend, when um, the the rate at which your wealth grows doesn't grow at with everybody else's, then you don't have an incentive to do good by them, right? Mm -hmm. right. And so that actually has an important implication for, or potential explanation, theoretical explanation for why it's the case North Korea, despite all of the gains associated with say opening up their borders and international trade, effectively refuses to do any of that sort of stuff, right? Because the wealth of the ruler doesn't correlate in any way with the wealth of the people. There's no incentive, right? Basic economics. Right. Uh, but yeah, so the, all, all that's to say, again, like going back, the key point is that, uh, I, don't, I, I can't remember what the, the original point was, but it's like constraint, constraints matter. And like, it tends to be the case that politicians, like governments, despite them producing ostensibly the same good, which is protection, they face a different set of constraints. So we might prefer one as opposed to the other. Right. Yeah, it's interesting because I would think that, um, you know, if you're gonna leave, like, let's say you don't like the mafia services and you're gonna go to a competitor, right? It's not like you can, that's easily transferable to the state, which presumably has, you know, more scale and probably a bigger territory and more defined territory, you know, that you, you know, can't really get out of when maybe if, you know, Tony is running the neighborhood, you can just, you know, transition to somebody else, maybe if he doesn't have clear boundaries. Yeah. So you could even make the case that mafias are superior providers of gov of protection services. Uh, mm. I, I won't claim that, but at least that's theoretically plausible. Right, right. Um, you know, I, in, in the downfall of a lot of organized crime is the fact that they do become too big. They do eclipse so many other, uh, you know, industries and, and sectors, uh, and they have more 
it gives the, it makes them a bigger target for the state uh, to take them down with. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's, that's certainly the case. They, they, um, Asimoglu and a number of other authors have a new paper out, which talks about, uh, I can't remember if he has a couple of papers on the mafia. I might be referring to a paper that came out two years ago, but they talk about the consequences of, of, of the mafia on growth. And it, so it turns out that, um, you know, there's a very strong correlation between uh, of like mafia presence in Italy and very low uh, literacy rates or like relatively lower literacy rates, higher child, um, hi- higher uh, rates of, of um, very young child death and that sort of thing. So there can be some severe consequences, unintended consequences of, of mafia, um, mafia presence and protection. But again, you have to also consider in those sorts of contexts, what are the alternatives? Right. You, uh, you mentioned before uh, that the mafia or organized crime, they would tend to bundle goods and services, right? Not just uh, protection. I was wondering like what kinds? So um, they are very often, for, so first of all, it varies geographically and it also varies across time as well. So it's really hard to say, the one thing I think you can be quite confident of is that a lot of the time organized crime, their primary service that they produce is going to be protection. Right. But they've more recently been, especially with the rise of the prohibition, um, there's a huge influx of cash. And so they turn to essentially loan sharking where they would l- loan money out to people who needed a lot of cash and in a very short period of time, um, and they would charge exorbitant rates. Okay, so loan sharking is one. Um, you know uh, what kind of rates they were charging? Um, I, you know, not off the top of my head. Audience. Okay, but, but, not off the top of my head. Higher, higher than what you would otherwise get on a in illicit market. Uh-huh, considerably exactly. higher. Um, so I, 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 if I could give a number, but I, 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 don't, I honestly don't remember. It's been, um, I haven't read enough about loan sharking, but if you guys want to know more about it, Reuter has a bunch of stuff on it. Um, okay. Yeah. I was just asking read. for reference. I, you know, we can only imagine how high those, those rates are. Yeah. Were. Not a hundred percent, but it's more like, I want to say like 20 or 30%. So con- <laughs> considerable, um, but still not ridiculous, like 100, 200%, that sort of thing. Um, <laughs> So that's the first thing. They've also been known for uh, arbitration and adjudication. So especially in the early mafia, in the period of the early mafia, I don't know as much about the more contemporary mafia, like 1930s and onwards, uh, essentially with the establishment of the official Cosa Nostra um, and the, the assembly. When there was a much lower, essentially, from the co- from the Costa Nostra on, it became much more difficult to figure out who the bosses are, and but prior to that, it was kind of a, it was the hierarchy was much lower, and so people tended to kind of get an idea. Even locals would have a better idea of who the boss really was. Okay, exactly. Yeah, great point. Great and point. And so when you have, when you're in it, in that sort of position, um, there's a dispute as in the case of the Godfather thing, the God, it's not historically correct, but you know, a guy comes in and asks, asks the Godfather Corleone to adjudicate street justice. When the state, when people do wrong by your family and, uh, some people get off because they have a brilliant lawyer or something like that, um, you will turn to street justice which the mafia tends to provide. They will also, especially in in the case of the early Sicilian mafia, they acted as guarantors. So they would supply in in a market where it's very costly to kind of figure out whether or not the the good or service that you're purchasing is of sufficient quality or not. So consider a horse and you don't know if the horse is like, has a dead leg or is gonna die in a year or something like that. Um, And so, when you're in a market for lemons, you need some sort of way to generate information or at least have some sort of guarantee about the quality of the product. Mm-hmm. Um, and on the other side, the guy who's selling the horse, he wants to make sure that you're going to pay up front, that he's not getting counterfeit cash or that you aren't going to ask for some sort of, you're going to delay your payments over some uh, ridiculous extended period of time. Mm-hmm. 
And so in that sort of situation, you might expect kind of in a prisoner's dilemma sort of situation, defect, defect, okay? And you get the inefficient equilibrium when really it's just an information cost problem. But this is where uh, that kind of inefficient problem increased the demand for arbitration services and guys who would essentially be able to say, listen, uh, I will be present at the exchange in the event that either one of you cheat, I will break both of your legs. Okay. Now it's not, a, it's not often that extreme, but I will at least intimidate you, damage your shop um, or in other ways, in, in other ways, make life relatively more difficult for you. Okay. Mm -hmm. And so in that, you could almost think of mafias, especially in the early period as market makers, right? Where there otherwise would not have been a market be, for, for, for lack of um, essentially information and guarantees the mafia stepped in. They, they fixed mm -hmm. the market failure, right? Mm -hmm. Because um, the state doesn't have all those creative options uh, to, to get what they want, uh, you know, to, to uh, effectuate the market the, the way they, uh, the mafia would. Uh, they precisely. Don't have as many, yeah, they don't have precisely. as many uh, channels the, to do that with. The demand for protection is positive and how you satisfy that demand is going to be contingent on whoever has the least cost provider um, in that particular market. Um, but you could think about, not only can you think about mafias as, um, uh, as market makers, but Scapardas, who's another big guy in, in the economics of uh, organized crime, he characterizes them as gap fillers, as institutional gap fillers, providing protection where the state won't or cannot. Um, and essentially because like even like imagine for a moment if you went out west, right? After the immediately after the Louisiana Purchase, right? no one lives out there, but you go and live in a society of people. You're effectively living the the, geog the geography makes it prohibitively costly for the eastern states to enforce property rights out there, right? They only have so many policemen, they have only have so many adjudication services, and so it's just not worthwhile to protect property rights out there. So you got, so in those sorts of contexts, the demand for protection hasn't changed at all, right? Mm -hmm. But the supply curve has. And so you're going to substitute on the margin to other alternative um, producers. In the case of the Western states, it's tended to be self-enforcing exchanges rather than the mafia, but you get the idea. Yeah. Um so yeah, cover, that covers kind of like the demand side of like, you know, demand for the protection racket perhaps. But I know in your research, you talk about the supply. And I was wondering what factors um, go into like um, producing or maybe the demand for new recruits um, in the mafia. Like you talk about um, like the, uh, I see like the, um, like the more a criminal organizations, some are more difficult to enter uh, than others. Yeah. Yeah. So, so it, during, so a after the paper, I, after kind of I, I delayed or set aside the paper on the prohibition for a while, um, where I put it down in order to work on this other paper because I heard about things that were called black hand societies. It's like I, I've never heard of those, but apparently they were everywhere for essentially between 1900 and 1920. Like that's very odd. It's this mysterious, all powerful society that was running around, sending people letters and extorting people, blowing up bombs, kidnapping kids, doing all sorts of heinous crimes. Um, and I thought that's very odd. I want to know a little bit more about that. Mm -hmm. So during my research, I realized that first of all, uh, the Black Hand Society was fake news for lack of a better term. It was a bunch of independent criminal organizations sending letters to people, to victims, essentially demanding payments, demanding tribute. But there are a couple of them that actually specialized in that kind of extortion. One of which is called the Society of the Banana. And I realized that the Society of the Banana, as ridiculous a name as it is, um, they were a pretty, for the period, they were a relatively large criminal organization. They had about 14 to 18 members, no more than 20. Um, and they had considerably less, they were considerably less difficult to get into relative to early mafia families. Okay, so the Society of the Banana, they operated mostly in Marion, Ohio, or at least that's where everybody met together. That was kind of like they had weekly meetings or at least semi-weekly meetings where uh, members would essentially come in, divide profits and then and 
essentially give updates to each other about the the relative markets of extortion. Sorry to interrupt you. Society oh, of Banana. What what time frame are you talking about right now? Nineteen. They operate from a, at least nineteen oh three through nineteen ten, okay. right? But they it was in conjunction with a bunch of other gangs that were also engaging in this sort of extortion, which I'll come back to in a second. Um, but as it turns out, there's a huge gap between the requirements to get into the Society of the Banana and early mafia families. And the, the case that I considered in my research is the Morello family, okay? Morello family operated pri primarily in New York and the Society of the Banana operated primarily in, in Ohio. Now, what makes them such good contrasting cases is that they're operating at the same time. Both gangs have Italian origins and uh, both practice extortion both practice extortion extensively, right? And yet the Society of the Banana had considerably lower entrance requirements relative to the Morello family. And let me give you an idea of what those entrance requirements were like, okay? So it tended to be the case, it appears that most of the members had to have some sort of criminal experience, but that wasn't a binding constraint. Um, like other black hand societies of the period, you had to pay cash. So there was, there was an example of a kid having to pay 25 bucks to get into the organization. Uh, he had to wait, even though he was initiated and made an official member, he had to wait three months uh, before he got a claim to the, to the treasure or the, the revenue of the gang. And as it turns out, he was actually, that same kid was intimidated into joining the gang. He didn't actually want to join the gang. But he was convinced. They made him an offer he couldn't refuse. He was convinced to join the gang. And uh, that seems like, okay, so that's kind of difficult to get into. You got to pay a little bit. You got to do some non-monetary stuff like be a criminal, have some sort of criminal track record. Although this kid, I don't think did. Uh, you contrast that with the Morella family, which is essentially grew into one of the, like its offshoots created the five families of New York. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and so it was, it was um, led by this guy, Giuseppe, if I have that name correctly, Giuseppe Morello. And you essentially, you had to be a family member, right? You had to be directly, you had to have blood ties to the gang. If you didn't have blood ties to the gang, then you had to get a letter of recommendation from a mafioso, from a current mafioso. And if you didn't have that, um, then what was the other, that was the other part. So if you didn't get a letter of sponsorship, you could also be a member of the Sicilian ma mafia who transplanted and moved to the United States. Okay, so already you, you could also have... be you could also be half related too. You can, by by ethnicity, you could also be half quarter, in some way, a portion of your um, you know uh, your genes had to be of Italian origin. Yeah, so well. they're, they're like a half brother was in. Um, I, I I know that I know the brother in law was also part of the Morello family. Um, and there were also family members in the Society of the Banana, but it seems to be the case that with at least within the early Mafia families and the Morello family as well, um, there was a much more stringently enforced norm relative to the Society of the Banana. Um, and there's some indication that you had to have some sort of extensive criminal experience as well. It might be the case. I haven't been able to verify this. But a lot of historians and FBI agents have said that in early periods of the mafia, you had to also commit a murder. Okay. I've not been able to verify this, but this just goes, I just use that as an example that generally the Morella family tended to have much higher, it, it expected much more of members in order prior to initiation. Okay. Mm -hmm. And so um, the question is, what explains the variation? So you might also, as an aside or in an analogous case, you can ask this, the same question of like fraternities on Mason's campus. I know that fraternities aren't big at Mason, but they're big at Clemson, my undergrad program, okay? And there were fraternities where like, it was a walk in the park, like farmhouse. You like say hello and you're initiated, right? But when it came to something like, um, like, the reliability Kai, and quality of members uh, is, a, that's is greatly that, affected by that. It's, it's greatly affected by that, right? And so in the case of Sikai, they you make you do all sorts of ridiculous things, okay? So it, it's the same sort of case, just to help you think, mm -hmm. think through oh, it's it, right? It's a great example, fantastic example. Um, and 
So the question is, what might explain the differences in what you might call an asset price? Okay. So what explains the price of membership? It's like, like an iPhone. Why are iPhone 12s more expensive than iPhone 5s? So it's not, it's actually not that hard. It's like you get more bang for your buck for an iPhone. And so your willingness to pay increases. Okay. So one compelling theory is gangs, the Morella family has a serious problem with monitoring people who are current members. So they make, make, uh, candidates impose really high costs on themselves in order to screen out low commitment people in order to increase the increase the quality of the people who ultimately become initiated okay naturally the highest cost you could impose upon someone is is having them you know commit a crime of of such gravity in in equilibrium in equilibrium the guys who are most willing to pay are going to be the highest quality members who actually Mm -hmm. end up paying paying the fee so that's one thing, but that depends entirely upon internal monitoring costs. And I don't think it can explain it. So, and here's why. So Society of the Banana, lower entrance fees. And yet they, the members, this is like my trump card that, that I, I, I'm very excited about that I only realized like a few weeks ago, um, which is that, all of the men, or at least a large number of the 18 member, 14 to 18 members were spread out in different states. So they were in Pennsylvania, they were in Ohio, they met in Ohio, but they were in Pennsylvania, New York, and Ohio. And not only that, but they were spread out in different cities as well. Okay. So that means if you think about just information costs, it's much harder for the, the chief or the boss to monitor people when they're operating in different cities. Okay. The Morella family, by contrast, were reserved to East Harlem. They were on one street in East Harlem. Okay. So information mm. costs, at least within the group, seem to be considerably lower for the Morello family. And yet the requirements were considerably higher. So to my mind, the, the member quality thing isn't a convincing explanation. So there has to be something else going on. And my argument depends largely upon what kind of protection and extortion the members, the different gangs were producing. And in large part depends upon the, the costs of defending your reputation. Okay. And I'll explain, I'll walk through the logic. So as it turns out, or l- let me just briefly walk through the logic. So um, when it's really costly to exclude free riders, from your reputation then it's going to be then customers who are not myopic right they're going to reduce their demand for your services okay because it's like i don't know who you are i can't guarantee that you selling the protection that you're selling me is what i actually want so my demand for your services will fall which means the overall revenue of the gang will fall which means that the demand for entrance will also fall so it's like three different steps okay but it should be intuitive and I'll, and I'll tell you why in a sec. So the society, the banana, they specialized in a particular kind of extortion. They extorted all of their victims by mail. Not only did they extort all of their members by mail, they signed it with a black hand. They didn't sign the society, of the banana. They signed with a black hand. Okay. The Morella family, by contrast, tended to extort their victims in person. They set their members to essentially say, hey, buddy, you got to pay up this month. You got to <laughs> give me the money, right? And so now that should immediately come to mind. It's like the costs of identifying and then punishing potential free riders or people who are pretending to be part of the gang are considerably lower for the Morella family relative to the society, society of the banana. Because all you got to do is essentially write a letter. You owe me $10,000. Uh, I'm part of the black hand. Send right? As it turns out, and so my my point is, there are the costs of, because the Morello family faced considerably lower costs of identifying and then punishing interlopers because they extorted victims by hand um, or in person, uh, the demand for their extortion services increased, which means their revenue increased, which means the demand for entrance increased, which when you have an upward sloping supply curve for membership, then that's going to lead to a price increase for membership. Okay. Mm. And so 
here's the evidence that I'm going to bring to bear when I, when I, when this paper essentially, when I send this paper out, all kinds of random people were engaging in black hand extortion. There were, there were school kids. There was one kid who tried to extort a shop and was actually shot and killed. Yeah. He, he was like, he read these cow, he read these mafia and these black hand books. And he's like, Oh, here's a really easy way to do this. I'm going to earn money this way. And then, go be a cowboy or something like that. He was like 15, right? And he ended up sending this letter and the cops thought it was a, a legitimate black hand society and they ended up shooting this poor kid. And there were school girls that did that. They were um, employees who were pissed off at their, uh, at their bosses. It's like, you're not paying me enough. I'm going to send you a black hand letter. Uh, and so the point is, it's like, listen, when you get a letter, you're like, there's no way I can verify that this is credible, that the threat is credible, one. And two, how can I be sure that when I pay the money, you won't send me another letter immediately afterwards, which is also what happened, right? Mm-hmm. There are examples of people essentially paying $2,000 after they were, they were, they were paid to, they paid $2,000. Two weeks later, the same guy, you got the same letters and like, you got to pay up. It's like, oh, what, what the hell? I just paid, right? But the, what the it, threat, what, the message, Sorry, go ahead. Go ahead. No, no, no. Well, I was just going to say, and the last, the last thing that I want to bring to mind is like very, the, the people who were able to successfully extort their victims, they never got what they asked for. They would demand $10,000. How much did they actually get? It was usually like $400, $1,000. It was never that much. And because they knew they had to, in other words, compensate for their non-credibility of the demand, they would have to send people over to essentially haggle with the victims, right? So they would send someone who knew gang members, but weren't affiliated, pardon me, weren't affiliated with the gang. And he'd be like, hey, man, I heard you got a letter. I can help you. I can help you work this thing out. And it's like, oh my God, thank you so much. And his job was essentially to essentially haggle with the person to push up the price. But again, as I said, they rarely ever got the $10,000, rarely ever did. And that just goes to show you again, that the demand for that kind of protection services, because you couldn't credibly figure out who was sending the letter, one, and two, you couldn't be sure that you wouldn't be sort of again in the future, dramatically reduced the demand for the services. And so as a result, the revenues were lower, the membership requirements were lower. So that's a, like a long-winded spiel about what I've been working on and thinking about entrance requirements and stuff like that. But there you go. Yeah. yeah no. and, and, and the rec, you know, how rep, how much, you, how easily you could replicate that threat too um, is, is also a, a variable. Uh, you know, when the, when the threat is easily uh, replicable, it's, it's not, it, it, it's credibility as a threat is reduced over time. Um, so that affects uh, people's willingness to actually follow through with, uh, you know, paying or, or participating in the extortion. You can uh, think about it like a fixed cost, right? So high fixed costs, markets where you have really high fixed costs will tend to have a much higher concentration ratio relative to, relative to uh, markets where you have very low fixed costs, okay? And so the fixed cost of writing a letter are like pen and paper and like a stamp. The fixed cost for extorting someone in person, it's like, you got to be equipped. You got to be ready to fight. You got to run away from the cops in case they show up. So like the fixed costs are, and so just by that in itself shows you that, you know, those within that market might have a little bit higher demand curves. But I'm, but to my mind, the thing that has all of the explanatory weight that I'm trying to suggest has all the explanatory weight is this inability to protect your reputation. Because otherwise you'll have people like to give you another example. So Gambetta in his book, he talks about the mustache, um, the mustache gang in France. Okay. And it's like these bank robbers who robbed a couple banks when they were wearing mustaches or like a mask with a mustache or something like that. And uh, they were pretty successful. It, the story blew up. And then all across the country, there were a bunch of bank attempted bank robberies of guys doing the same thing. And then all of a sudden, again, because that particular gang couldn't protect its reputation, you had a bunch of free riders, random interlopers, essentially cashing in on the fact that their reputation wasn't protected, um, which uh, it, which ended up 
depreciating, overexploiting the resource, which is the reputation's value. Because you can think about it like a commons, right? When you have a commons, people are going to send their, they're going to graze their cattle too often there. Same logic applies here. When you, repu- when you can't fence your, your commons, you can't fence your reputation, then it's going to be overexploited and um, the value of the resource in the long run will be depreciated extensively. Yeah, I think what it logically follows that, um, you know, the society of the banana sounds like they would have had a much shorter lifespan than the Morello family, considering that, you know, anyone could copycat them. Was that necessarily the case? So uh, it, it, they, their life tragically was cut too short. They were uh, essentially disbanded after a bunch of their members were arrested in 1909, mm-hmm. um, which is interesting because the Morella family, a whole bunch of members of the Morella family, uh, I want to say like eight or nine, um, were also arrested at about the same time. Now, the Morella family managed to survive past that um, for at least, at least another... 10 years before things got a little bit more complicated um, and a bunch of other gangs essentially came to the entered, entered the markets. Um, so I, I, you're right. Theoretically you expect that gang to, they would have to substitute in some other kind of extortion, mm-hmm. right? Cause the black hand extortion really just can't last that long, which was empirically the case. If you look at the number of um, newspaper articles mentioning black hand societies over time, of which there's some evidence. I just, I actually went and gathered all the data and it was, is a hassle. A lot of research is, <laughs> is like really drudgery, but uh, I, I got a whole bunch of historical newspapers, um, like 25 newspapers, who, which go as far back as 1900. And there's a huge spike in mentions of the Black Ann societies and then an almost immediate downturn and decline right after that, right? And then after that, it's like, barely people barely mention it during the prohibition but that's really it so it goes to show you that it was like kind of like a fad if you want to think about it yeah sounds like yeah. they need better ip for that black hand imprint exactly yeah. that's what they should have done yeah <laughs> and just to clarify for our audience too uh you know of course temporarily over time things became more nuanced there had to be more clandestine activity things had to become more secretive uh, people were less in the public eye um, as far as, you know, uh, members at the top of uh, these criminal organizations. So the mechanics yeah. probably shifted and changed as time went on. Um, but when especially it comes to the pro- during the prohibition. Exactly, exactly. Uh, and, and especially as the state, uh, you know, uh, uh, became more fixed upon uh, organized crime and, and how, yep. how big it was becoming. Um, what, uh, what kind of incentives did the prohibition offer for organized crime factions to transition from extortion-based revenue to ownership of assets. Mm-hmm. Ex- extortion versus owning is, is what I'm trying to focus on. So uh, that I've been, f- the other thing I like besides organized crime is, are contracts and trying to think about the economics of contracts. Um, and to give you an example, like why do people, why are people paid salaries as opposed to a wage contract as opposed to a piece rate contract, as opposed to a share contract. Theoretically, again, in the same way that in zero transaction cost world, you'd be indifferent between the state and the mafia as a provider protection. You'd be indifferent between a wage contract, a piece contract, a share contract, et cetera, okay? Um, and so I, it, it, some of the historical evidence for organized crime contracts tend to show some sort of strange systematic variations. So in the case of the alcohol production chain, you have manufacturers whose job it was to produce the beer. You have distributors whose job was to deliver the beer. And then you have retailers whose job it was to sell it to customers or consumers, the final consumer. It tended to be the case that criminal organizations owned a bunch of distribution assets but they didn't really own saloons and they didn't really appear to own manufacturing plants. And so if you want to think about why is it the case that organized crime tended to own trucks and boats, for example, but then tended to demand tribute payments from breweries and distilleries, 
and then saloon keepers and blind pig owners. What explains that contractual variation? And I, we, I, I've been thinking, or I, I spent a decent amount of time thinking about it. And it's a paper I've been working on with Peter Hazlitt um, for a while. And I think it's got something to do with uh, the claim that I make is it's something to do with monitoring costs, which is like, imagine you have a team of, of 11 people, right? Like, I, do you either of you guys follow soccer at all? Yeah. yeah. Right. So you have a, 11 teammates. Okay. Imagine everybody makes the same number of passes. Mm-hmm. Nobody scores, but everybody makes the same, same number of passes. Uh, how do you choose the team captain? It's not entirely clear how you, how you make that choice. Um, unless you, ha- you know, signaling at that point. Signaling a little bit, but part of the argument that I try and make is that um, what matters, what you really want to do is you want to give the person whose total contribution is most difficult to measure the ownership of the firm. So in the case, think about team production. Let me back up. I probably went too broad a field with the teammate case. Um, so Demsets and Alshin, two prominent property rights and industrial organization economists, have a, a fantastic paper in which they say, which they try and explain the existence of firms. And they argue that there's some sort of monitoring cost that makes it hard to evaluate the contribution of any particular employee. So what do you do instead? You hire someone who's a specialist in monitoring and you say, listen, bud, I want you to watch us and make sure none of us are shirking or cheating. And then we're going to pay you out of the profits of the firm. You pay us a wage. You get to keep the profits. But in the case of uh, in my particular model, you can't hire an outside firm owner. You need to choose a member of the firm from within the group. Okay. And in that particular case, there's no, there's no, ostent, there's no a priori specialist in monitoring. Okay. So what do you do instead? Well, you choose the guy whose contribution is most difficult to monitor because by doing that, his incentive to shirk at the expense of his fellows is going to be curtailed. He'll have where otherwise he would have a very large incentive to free ride off of the output of his, of, of his friends. By giving him the profits, you better correlate his contribution with his compensation. Okay. And so someone's, then you got to ask yourself, step back and ask yourself, well, what are the, what are the factors that might increase someone's total output? Well, his per unit measurement, measuring his per unit uh, contribution could be really, really high. So imagine everybody contributes the same number of inputs it could be just really difficult to measure each one of his inputs relative to all the others. So his per unit input measurements, per unit input measurement costs are are higher relative to anybody else. Or alternatively, everybody could be equally easy to monitor, but he just contributes 15 million inputs. And so his share of all inputs is very, very high. And if you have to monitor or assess um, the quality of each of his inputs, his, the total cost of his measurement of measuring his contribution are very, very high. Okay. So there are two different factors that could lead someone to have kind of uh, differentially high modern costs. And in that case, you want to give that guy ownership of the firm. Uh, because again, if he were to be employee, an employee paid a wage or paid a per, per piece contract, um, then again, his incentive to free ride would be very, very large and reduce everybody's output. It reduce, it reduce the output of the firm and reduce everybody's income in the long run. The firm would fail. And so he actually has an incentive to say, listen, make me the firm owner. I'll keep the profits. I'll pay you guys a wage. And I won't cheat as much as I would otherwise because I'm keeping the profits. That would hurt my profits too much. Okay. So in the case of prohibition and alcohol, as it turns out, um, the distribution stage, again, think manufacturing, manufacturing, distribution, and retailing. Um, the distribution stage was uniquely susceptible to interruption by random bootleggers and other gangs, which means that the demand for protection was the highest. 
and you in the think, distribution uh, in in the distribution stage the supply chain. Yep. in the supply chain relative to manufacturing and relative mm-hmm. saloon keeping there were saloon keeping robberies of course the optimal rate of crime is is positive and there were uh, manufacturing robberies as well but it was by by far the most dangerous part of the supply chain was distribution okay and so simply by the fact that the demand for protection was highest in distribution. It's not like they were any more difficult to, to monitor or like it, consider that you have a truck driver and a gang member. Okay. It's like, it's not like the contribution of the truck driver is any more difficult to monitor than the contribution of the gang member. It's like, okay, like, did you shoot the guys? Did you deliver the alcohol? Right. So it, I'm making the claim that they seem to have equal per unit monitoring costs. But as it turns out, because the demand for protection was so high, you didn't need one guy protecting it. You needed five or you needed Mm -hmm. 10, right? Mm -hmm. Which Mm -hmm. increases the total contribution by the gang, which gives them an enormous opportunity to like, oh yeah, we were protecting it, but like something came up so we couldn't make it. Or they would fight a little bit less, um, like the ninth and the 10th guys would fight less vigorously because it's harder to monitor them and so uh it makes sense to actually give compensate the criminal organizations out of the profits as opposed to compensating them in some other contractual form um and i also verify a little bit this theory with policy gambling as well so it also turns out that organized crime owned slot machines but tended to extort uh essentially what were called policy dens or uh, uh, policy controllers. And the same sort of logic applies, which is that slot machines are really easy to set up. You don't have to monitor them, right? So Mm -hmm. if you think about two inputs, gambling inputs and protection inputs, because gambling at the time was also illegal, right? Or it was at least in a gray Mm -hmm. zone. Um, Gambling inputs, protection inputs, they're really easy to monitor. They don't supply a lot of inputs the optimal owner is going to be the gang in the case of policy making where it's, it's like you're receiving information. It was essentially like lottery stuff, um, lottery gambling and all kinds of different variants on lotteries. And in that case, you actually really, you needed highly trained controllers to be able to manage the numbers and manage the balance sheets of the controlling organization. Um, And so even though, they were still had a demand for protection and they needed protection from the cops and other gangs. It tended to be the case that uh, these controllers contributed more inputs per, again, they contributed a higher volume of inputs, Mm -hmm. which means that it's cost minimizing to pay them out of the profits and then pay the gang a kind of percentage fee or some sort like small percentage fee or some tribute each week. Um, rather than paying them, like giving them a large ownership share in the, in the organization. So again, I, I think that, I think contracts beyond the state are fascinating, which is a lot of, a lot of contracts um, aren't enforced by police or by government. People actually do super well by themselves of kind of creating mutually beneficial contracts that are self-enforcing. And that is what I, that's a theme that I'd like to bring out more in my work, especially in the case of organized crime, because again, they produce services. They can't rely on the state. Cause again, <laughs> like I won't put you guys on the spot, I'm, but I'm sure you've known people in the past who were drug dealers in high school. Okay. It's like, if they get in trouble, if they get in trouble, they're not going to run to the cops if someone didn't pay up. Right. What do they get? What do they do? Well, it's like, they either bear You're the gonna losses. are going to get creative very creative. They're going to have to get it very creative. So they're going to have to bear the losses themselves, eat the losses or come up with a very in like creative and clever way of making sure that their customers actually pay the money that's owed to them. Right. Sometimes they might intimidate them, but at other times they'll like, I don't know what they make would their do. lives much harder. You know, like, in some way they'll try and impose some cost of them. And maybe with um, the ease of communication today, they can say it to other drug dealers. Hey, don't sell this dude. You know? That's a great point. It, they can create some sort of quasi guilt. It's like, yeah. listen, this guy wow. cheated yeah. me, so quasi don't ever treat this guy again. Yeah, I love that. I love that. that. Um, yeah. 
And, and so, but that's all to say, it's like, listen, these guys are creating valuable exchanges without using the state to enforce the contract. It's like, right. So anyway, um, that's been another theme in my research and I'm trying to, to build that out. I'm, I have some other stuff that I've been doing on breweries, vertical integration and in breweries and contracts in, in brewers and stuff like that. Um, which is kind of along the same lines, like, oh, modern costs matter. Uh, but in this case, the stories, the parties are a little bit different. Yeah, no, it sounds awesome. Uh, looks like that's all the time we got, but thank you so much for yeah. that and bringing us into the world of, you know, the extortion contracts outside of the state, really. Yeah, no, listen, yeah. It's, been a, it's been a lot of fun. Yeah, yeah. thank you for, you know, most people think of these, these organizations as monoliths, uh, but breaking down the nuance of them and, and uh, you know, uh, you talk focusing on so many other aspects of, of how they conduct business and, and you know, industrial organization and, and everything else. Uh, we really appreciate you for, for talking about. So it, it, it's been a pleasure. I'm, I'm hoping I'm still a student. So I'm just trying to bequeath to you some of the information that I've accumulated over the past few years and some of the stuff that I've been thinking about. And who knows, I could change my mind on this stuff uh, going forward, but this is, this is what I think up until now and I feel pretty good about it. So, uh, but I really appreciate, listen, I, I appreciate you guys having me on. I really enjoyed yeah. it. Um, and uh, I'm looking forward to seeing you guys in some of my classes in the future. Yeah, yeah. That's yeah. <laughs> Real quick, do you have a, like a forthcoming paper that you'd like to plug on this or? Uh, it's a working paper, but it's the title of which is probably going to be the black hand. I don't have a paper that I can share right now because, no, no uh, no uh, which I'd love to, but it's coming out soon. So keep your eyes open. All right. Great. It's in the oven. It's in <laughs> yeah, the oven. exactly. Yes. All right. Thank you so much, Henry. All right, guys, please like, and subscribe and join us next week, uh, for our meeting with, um, representatives from Mercatus Center to talk about the Schumpeter Fellowship. That'd be All fun. Right, take care and have a great night. You too.